Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Anton Heemrijk, and um, I'm the founder uh, of Access Europe together uh, with uh, Jonathan uh, Zeitlin and a professor in political science at the Free University of Amsterdam and Centennial Professor of uh, Social Policy at the London School uh, uh, of Economics. Um, Pascal Lamy is speaking here today and he really needs no uh, uh, introduction. We know him very well as the Director General uh, of the WTO uh, in the period 2005-2013. He's a graduate from uh, uh, ENA in, in Paris and he learned the tricks and trades of policy making, but I should really emphasize policy thinking from uh, 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 Jacques Delors. Um, and uh, he's been uh, um, active in the European Union, uh, in French uh, uh, politics and government, and, and later uh, more and more so uh, on issues of, um, of globalization in the relation uh, to the European uh, uh, integration uh, process. Presently, he is uh, president emeritus of uh, Notre Europe, and uh, I think this is a, a very good time in a way a tragic time, to have him here uh, with us uh, uh, today to speak about uh, uh, TTIP and also hopefully uh, to speak, to reflect on TTIP, TTIP and what it means uh, for uh, European um, uh, uh, integration. Because um, as we speak, Schengen uh, is, uh, is under pressure. Uh, uh, the single market may be falling apart in, uh, in June. EMU is uh, not creating the promise of socioeconomic uh, 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 convergence. Rather, it looks like it's an automatic destabilizer. Uh, and then there is TTIP. Uh, we had a referendum on the trade with the Ukraine um, a week ago. Um, and so, I mean, I'm sure there are forces lining up to, uh, to have uh, a referendum uh, on TTIP, you know, but before that happens, uh, uh, there are negotiations going on and they can be still quite lengthy. I mean, in that context, uh, Pas Pascal Ami is going to talk for, for about 40 uh, minutes and then we have uh, time for discussion for about 20, 25 uh, uh, minutes that I will chair. And now, Pascal Ami, I would like to give you uh, the floor and a warm welcome again to Amsterdam. Good evening uh, to everybody. Let me first uh, thank uh, you for this uh, invitation. As part of what I understand is a series of uh, lectures, uh, inputs, uh, that uh, purpose of which is to try and help getting the big picture. And of course, uh, I'm not that surprised that uh, for the Dutch, uh, trade is part of the big picture. Uh, as you may know, I come from France, uh, and I can tell you, for my compatriots, uh, trade is nowhere part of the picture. Uh, but I'm glad that you've taken this topic because I happen to believe that uh, it's a major one for the future. Now, opening trade is part of the uh, DNA of the uh, European Union uh, from the very beginning. Opening trade is something we Europeans have written in our constitution. Uh, since the Treaty of Rome, from the very beginning, and until now, as you know, our constitution is the Treaty of Lisbon, and let me read what our constitution says about Europe, about trade. Quote, the Union shall contribute in the common interest to the harmonious development of world trade, the progressive abolition of restrictions on international trade and foreign direct investment, and the lowering of customs and other barriers. So this is not a policy by the Commission. It's not a line that a daring trade commissioner has had to discuss with colleagues and with members, states in the council and with the parliament, it's deep ingrained into the software of the European Union. 
And this will be even more important uh, in the future uh, in that the EU, looking 5, 10, 15 years from now, uh, will be more dependent than until now on, the, on international trade. But we also have to know that uh, trade is uh, changing extremely rapidly uh, under the influence of uh, major uh, shaping factors uh, and that these changes raise new challenges uh, for the EU in its uh, trade uh, posture and policy and that this in turn uh, will uh, create uh, a necessity for Europe and the Union to adjust to these uh, changes. So let me uh, develop for introducing our conversation uh, successively these uh, four points. Number one, why is trade going to be more important? Uh, number two, what are the transformations uh, which are taking place on the world scene of trade. Number three, what sort of new questions does that trade? And number four, how should uh, or could uh, EU uh, confront them uh, in the future? To start with, uh, EU in the future uh, will be more dependent on uh, world trade. Whether uh, we, like it, we like it or not, uh, this is a reality that stems uh, from the consensus on uh, economic uh, forecasts, uh, medium and long term. If you look at consensus economic forecasts sort of on a 10-year basis, world growth around 3.5%. Uh, this 3.5% uh, being an average uh, between uh, two halves, <coughs> one half uh, which is uh, emerging countries uh, growing at roughly uh, 5%, uh, the other half uh, which is developed countries growing at roughly 2%. So 2 plus 5 divided by 2 is 3.5. The 2 in developed countries is roughly 2.53 uh, for US and 1 to 1.5 uh, for EU. Uh, let's leave Japan aside for the moment. But that means that 1 to 1.5 compared to US 2.5 to 3 compared to developing countries 5%, we know where the sources of growth will be. And unfortunately, uh, all things uh, equal, they will not be in Europe. They will be outside Europe. 90% for the 10 years to come, 90% of the increase in demand, which will be addressed to the European economy, will come uh, from the outside. Now, this is not very good news. A, because it says a lot about our own very low growth potential, all things equal. I believe this could be addressed, but under a number of uh, conditions. Uh, but if we don't address it, this is what is to happen. And this makes us, of course, uh, much more dependent uh, from uh, our environment uh, and from macroeconomic uh, evolutions, which we don't control. Uh, whether uh, China is uh, properly run or not is something on which we have, let's say, not a lot of influence. And yet, what happens and whether China is properly run or not is going to be more and more important for us uh, in the future. It may also have uh, repercussions in uh, other areas of uh, EU, uh, let's say, uh, foreign uh, and uh, security policy such as, for instance, uh, promotion of uh, democratic values or human rights. And we know that when we have to cope uh, with huge uh, elephants uh, like uh, China, for instance, or let's say India, 
or Africa, which is a growing elephant and which will be a big elephant uh, uh, 10 or 15 years from now, uh, we know that there are inevitable tensions between our economic interests and our political interests, our interests and our values. And this higher dependence of EU on world trade for its own growth creates a situation where the balance between our interests and our values may be changed. Now, again, we may not like this situation, uh, but we have to be uh, very clear. This is what will happen the most likely. And this will happen in a context uh, where our weight as EU uh, in the world economy uh, will shrink. Uh, the weight of the European Union in the world economy was roughly 25% uh, in the uh, years uh, 2000. It will be 15% uh, in uh, 2030. So in the meantime, our relative position will have shrunk from 25% of the cake of the world economy uh, to 15%. Again, we may like this or not. We may draw a center number of consequences on the fundamental source of this situation, which is too low growth potential within Europe. But if we don't address this, this is what will happen. Now, this higher dependence on uh, world trade uh, will uh, take place uh, in a, within a transformation of uh, the trade uh, patterns, uh, which started, let's say, 20 years ago, and which is uh, happening uh, now uh, full speed. And this transformation uh, is uh, both about the uh, volumes of uh, world trade and about the composition of world trade. And in order to understand the challenges for the EU, you need to understand uh, what's, uh, what's happening on uh, both of these uh, fronts. Now, starting with volumes, volumes of world trade uh, are driven by a number of uh, shaping factors. Let me, for the sake of uh, brevity, uh, take only three of them. Number one, the growth of the middle class, which is the consumer engine of uh, the world economy. There are roughly today 2 billion people in the middle class on the 7 billion people that inhabit this planet. By 2030, uh, the 7 will be 9, and the 2 will be 5. So 3 billion people will join the middle class between now and 2030. And the 3 billion are 2 billion people in Asia and 1 for Latin America and Africa. Now, this is the places where consumer uh, demand uh, will grow uh, the most rapidly, and this inevitably has a huge impact on the flows of trade. So we have to think Asia. If we want to sell our goods, our services, we have to think Asia and start thinking uh, Latin America and Africa, and notably Africa, which, frankly speaking, is for the moment far below the radar screen of uh, many of the brains that think about the trade in the future in Europe. Second uh, shaping factor of the patterns and what determines the volumes and the flows of trade uh, is uh, the uh, growing multi-localization of production processes. Uh, the famous global value chains, uh, which have replaced a very ancient world where something was produced in a country uh, and exported in another country which would import it and consume it, so sort of two-country uh, system, uh, we've now moved uh, to a organization of production processes, uh, whether goods or services, uh, which is uh, sort of made in the world and not made in uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, US, uh, or the Netherlands. This, of course, has a, a huge uh, importance uh, on uh, the localization of production, uh, the source of this transformation being technology that 
crushes the cost of distance, and that creates opportunities for an easier, more facilitated international division of labor, because it's easy, because of the cost of distance shrinking, it's easier to localize the part of your production chain where you believe it's done more efficiently. So this is a, a huge leverage in increasing the efficiency, hence uh, the international uh, division of labor. This raises many questions, which we might uh, discuss uh, later on, uh, and notably uh, one important question uh, which I put on the agenda when I was DG of the WTO, uh, which is that in this world of global supply chains, uh, we have to measure trade differently from what we did in the past. If you keep measuring trade in volumes, which is the traditional way economists have measured trade, uh, then uh, the more multi-localization increases, the more volumes of trade you register, because if something crosses a border, it's trade, and then another is trade, and then another is trade. So if, if, uh, if a car used to be produced in one country for 100 and exported in another country for 100, you had 100 of world trade. Now that the car is produced, let's say, in five countries, each of them adding 20% of the value, what you register in world trade is 20, and then plus 20, which is 40, and then whoop, another country, plus 20, which is 60, and the volume of world trade you have for the production of the same car is 300. Now, you have the same car, you haven't produced more, but you have 300 of world trade, which is, by the way, the reason why this ratio uh, between the volumes of trade and GNP has increased so much. And it increases when multi-localization spreads, and it stops increasing when multi-localization stops spreading, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why we now have this formidably rapid reduction in this ratio between volume of trade and GNP, because you compare peers which is volumes, to apples, which is value addition. The GNP is a sum of value addition. So the normal consequence of that is very simple. Let's measure trade in value addition the way we measure GNP. And that's, by the way, uh, what economists have start, started doing. And of course, if you look at trade with the real lens you need to look at trade today, which is value addition, the picture is very different from the one uh, you have uh, with volumes. Take one example, which is this famous trade balance between the US and uh, China. Uh, let's say it's 100 measured in volume, M measured in value addition, it's 50. And why is it so? Because there's a lot of what China export to the US, which has a lot of US value addition. And notably, in the electronics, the whole part of what China exports to the U.S., which is made in brains in the U.S., is exported from China to the U.S. with a value as if it was in China. If you take an Apple device, uh, which is assembled in Foxcom in uh, Chengdu, and I visited this uh, factory a few years ago, 150,000 people at the time, now only 50,000, by the way, because they robotized part of the factory, uh, but they would assemble these bits and then export them to the US, and there was 5% of Chinese added value, and there was 35% of US added value. So I'm not expanding more on this, but this is one of the consequences of these uh, big changes. Another big change is which hopefully will happen, although it hasn't yet happened, but hopefully will happen, uh, is the impact of decarbonization of our economic systems on trade. If we take the assumption that more or less explicitly or more or less implicitly we are moving in the direction of a carbon price, which is what's happening, it's, it's messy, it's complex, we don't have what we should have, which is a nice 40% or 40 or 45 uh, world price in euros uh, for carbon, but we are moving in the direction. This, of course, reallocates a lot of production systems. 
the moment carbon will be priced at its normal environmental externality, this will change if uh, Indonesia is good at uh, producing uh, turbines, uh, which is a relatively uh, non-rocket science uh, technology, uh, but you can do lots of economies of scale. Let's assume uh, renewables take the part they should take, then Indonesia will start exp using its comparative advantage in producing cheap turbines, and this, in turn, uh, will influence the volumes of world trade. This, to sum up this part of the system, uh, understand the simple measure that roughly the uh, import content of exports worldwide average are moving by plus one percent per year. Worldwide, the average import content of export was 15 percent 20 years ago. It's 25 percent now and it will be 40 percent by 2030. Uh, which is the numbers that show the increasing imbrication of our production systems. Now, not only does volume change as a consequence of these transformations, composition uh, of trade uh, also changes. Here again, uh, to put it simply, three main uh, components that you should have in mind. First, is uh, what the specialists uh, call the self servicification of trade, the growing part of services in trade. Going back to my previous observation about volumes and value addition, if you measure trade in volumes today, you have 62% of trade which is goods, and the rest is services. If you measure trade in value addition, it's exactly the other way around you have 62% of world trade, which is services, and the rest is goods. And why is it so? Because goods, in a way, the production of goods is for the moment more multi-localized than the production of services, but the production of services is also going in this direction. The moment uh, Indian uh, doctors uh, will do uh, uh, distance uh, surgery uh, for a lot of uh, Florida inhabitants, the growth of trade and services will explode, including in areas different from what we know, which is we know that telecoms are traded, we know that financial services are traded, we know that transport systems are traded, we know that tourist is a, an important services trade, but there's a lot of our economies which is not yet traded and which technology will allow to, start to trade, and then creating new situations where the borders between trade and goods and trade and services, uh, which are not very important for economists, but which are very important for lawyers, because the legal regimes of goods and the legal regimes of services are different, the frontier between goods and services uh, becomes extremely fuzzy. Uh, let's assume uh, uh, I have a problem with my car. Uh, and I have uh, now in my garage a 3D printer. So I need to fix one of the pieces of my car. I go to my 3D printer, so on. I get the piece, I put it on my car. I'm glad because I fixed my problem. Uh, and the file I had uh, imported in my computer uh, was coming from India. Now. Trade-wise, what have I done? Have I imported a good or have I, have I imported a service? Nobody knows. And by the way, if you take the tablet or the phone you have in your pocket and you look at the value content of the thing, which is the thing, it's an artifact and we would call it a good, but 95% of the value of what you have in your pocket has nothing to do with goods. It has to do with brain juice. It has to do with services. So that's moving and moving and moving. And of course, a lot of these services uh, entail a huge and growing flow of data. Data flows 
are becoming more and more of an infrastructure of world trade, which, by the way, also will have to impact the way we measure trade. Uh, because if uh, the research service of Walmart, which is located somewhere in the US, sells part of its client base data mining to uh, Ahold uh, or to Carrefour, this is a huge exportation value. But maybe it's going to be zero in the way we compute world trade. So this also will need to change. And finally, what will bring important changes in uh, the composition of, uh, of trade is the growing concerns of consumers about requirements which have to do uh, with what they believe is the relationship they have with what they buy. Uh, and we know that the relationship we have with what we buy uh, is more and more influenced by considerations uh, other than just the price of what we buy. It's always been true for food, uh, which is why trading food is not exactly geared the same way as trading socks or tires. Uh, but it's becoming also true uh, for tires and for socks, as consumers start wondering about whether the way this is produced uh, is good for health or environment uh, or animal welfare, and that's a direction which will influence a lot. The composition of trade and the ability of producers to fit with uh, these uh, new trends in uh, consumer demand. Now, this leads me to my uh, third point. All these big changes which are taking place full speed under a major engine, which is technology and globalization, all this, as a consequence, changes the pattern of obstacle to trade. And roughly, we move from an old world to a new world. The old world of obstacle to trade is the one I was trained in as a trade negotiator for part of my life. The old world of trade was a world where obstacle to trade stemmed from measures the purpose of which was to protect the producer from foreign competition. Tariffs, subsidies, uh, local content uh, requirement for public procurement, things which you establish in order to limit competition from foreigners. And that's the story of uh, trade negotiations and trade treaty and trade regulations from the uh, first treaty of commerce 23 centuries ago between the pharaoh of Egypt and the king of uh, which is uh, now uh, Cyprus, uh, until the, tra the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which was uh, signed uh, and still remains to be ratified uh, between uh, US and 12 uh, Pacific countries. So during 23 centuries, most of the trade opening has had to do with removing this sort of protection. The new world of trade uh, is a world where Obstacle to trade stem not anymore from measures the purpose of which is to protect producers, but from measures the purpose of which is to protect consumers. Because consumers' views, imaginations, dreams, and nightmares are different from what they were in the past. And this is a totally different world. But this is where obstacle to trade are and will be more and more in relative terms in the future. Why is it so? Because a regulation, WTO, bilateral, has led to reducing, uh, let's say, tariffs, which 50 years ago were thought of 30, 40% to 
an average which is uh, worldwide trade weighted today 5%. So the level of average trade weighted protection worldwide through tariffs is 5%. The cost for an average producer of reaching to the global market as he or she has to adjust to different regulatory system in precaution is 20%. So if you look at the map of obstacle to trade today, you have four times more obstacles stemming from the necessity to adjust to different regulatory precautionary systems, whether level of precaution or whether administration of precaution. If I'm a random producer of roses, I have zero tariff to export to EU, zero tariff to US, zero tariff to Japan. I should be very happy in the old world. Trade is free. The problem is that we're not in this old world, we're in a new world. And in the new world, US citizens and EU citizens and Japanese citizens have concerns about pesticides. And so the border, there'll be somebody who look at uh, Rwandan roses, and if Rwandan roses match the US pesticide level, fine. But if the match is not there, zero import, as if the tariff was 2,000%. Same in Europe, same in Japan. The problem for the Rwandan producer of roses, being A, that he or she has to adjust to this level of precaution, so he has to produce with the costs that have to do <coughs> with eliminating or not using pesticides, so he has to use other instruments to get rid of the pests, which, as we know, are not that good for roses. That's one problem, but he or she has a second problem, which is that the level of pesticide residues in US, EU, or Japan are different. And even if and it happens sometime, even if it's the same, the way this level of pesticide is administered, how will I get a certification? How much will I have to pay to get my certification from the US Department of Agriculture or from the uh, EU agency uh, which is responsible for pesticide or for the same in Japan? So in this sense, precaution today and tomorrow is much more of a potential obstacle to trade than protection, roughly, again, four times. This new situation obliges us to look at precaution as the problem. But if you look in this direction, you will immediately understand that the way to get rid of obstacle to trade is fundamentally different in pre precaution as what it was in protection. In protection, it's very simple. You have an obstacle to trade, you have a tariff, you have a subsidy, you cut it, you eliminate it, you eliminate the measure. Now, maybe not in one shot, and this is why you had lots and lots of round of trade negotiations, moving from 30 to 20, 20 to 10, uh, but the nirvana of a trade negotiator as far as tariff is concerned is very simple, it's zero. So you cut until you go to zero. You eliminate the measure that is an obstacle to trade, which is the protection of your producer. And you do that all the more that if your import content of your exports keep growing, shooting on your imports makes less and less sense because the more the import content of what you export grows, the more shooting on your import deteriorates the competitiveness of your exports. So in this old world, protection is dead. It disappears by itself because of this growing interdependence of production system. Now, how do you get rid of the problem uh, the Rwandan uh, producer of flowers has. Now, there's intellectually, uh, there's a possibility, well, okay, you get rid of precaution. 
what minister will go to his uh, parliament or her parliament and say, ladies and gentlemen, we need to be nice to Rwanda because it's a poor country and trade is great and they will help Rwanda develop in using their comparative advantage in roses and for the price of doing this, we are going to reduce our pesticide level we administer at the border. No parliament on earth will ever do that. So the avenue of getting rid of the measure is closed. For political reasons, it's a no-go. So you're left with the other option, uh, which is to eliminate not the measure, but the differences in the measure. The name of the game will remain leveling the playing field, which is where producers can create economies of scale, hence efficiencies which benefit the consumer and the own. Ricardo Schumpeterian model, which is why trade opening works uh, for welfare under a number of conditions. So leveling the playing field in the old world was you cut, you get rid, you kill. Disappears. Leveling the playing field in the new world is you address the difference. And you address it with a clawback system. You address it either equal or plus. You have to know that addressing it minus will not work. People will not accept that what they care about in animal welfare or pesticide residues or data privacy or GMOs is this level of precaution is dumped for the sake of opening trade. Now, this is a huge difference. There are a few other differences which I uh, do not insist on too much. Uh, uh, another big difference is that the political economy of the trade game, sort of domestic politics, and trade has a lot to do with domestic politics, changes. When I was a tariff negotiator in the old world, I basically had my domestic producers against me <coughs> because opening trade would increase competition on them, and I had consumers with me. Consumers you know, were relatively happy that you know, trade <coughs> led to uh, better prices. Now, consumers are not demonstrating in the streets to ask for trade, whereas uh, T-shirt producers uh, uh, could demonstrate in the streets if they lost their job, and this is uh, perfectly legitimate. But this equation was relatively simple, and at the end of the day, you have more consumers than producers in your domestic constituency. Even if there is a t-shirt factory that has to close uh, next door, the number of beneficiaries that go and buy their t-shirt at uh, Walmart, uh, Carrefour, or Ahold uh, is such that the politics of that are roughly okay. In the world of precaution, it's totally different. I have the producers with me because they are appetized at the notion that they will have a simple standard, one system of certification, one norm, one norm for pesticide residues, for safety of cars, for data privacy. So if they have a single standard, they do the economy of scales. We crush the 20%, which I mentioned previously. And that's great because having producers with you is good in politics, but the problem is that you risk having the consumers against you. Because the consumers, or consumer organizations might be tempted, and that's what they are paid for, uh, might be tempted to say, ha ha, careful, they are going to dump the level of precaution in order to satisfy these uh, big corporates uh, who are multinationals and who are operating uh, on global markets. So the political equation is very different. Another big difference, uh, and again, I don't want to insist too much on that, Another big difference uh, will be that the ideological pillars of the interaction uh, between uh, trade and development have changed. In the old world of trade with tariffs, I, let's say, I'm back to my previous position of European Trade Commissioner, and I will uh, say 
Uh, in order to be fair, I import roses from Rwanda, uh, from Costa Rica, uh, from Israel. Zero tariff for Rwanda, 10% for Costa Rica, because it's richer than Rwanda, and 20% for Israel, uh, because uh, it's richer than Costa Rica. And I have a sort of fair, nice trade policy that contributes to development because I give a specific part of advantage to poorer countries as compared <laughs> to richer countries. Good thing, everybody is happy. In the new world of trade, this possibility evaporates. As we say in trade jargon, precaution is MFN. <laughs> Precaution is prevents any sort of positive or negative discrimination. There's no way, I'm going to say, pesticide residues for Rwandan flowers are a bit less stringent than for roses from Costa Rica, and we're going to be very strict on pesticide residues with Israel. It just doesn't make sense. So this whole part of the interaction between trade and development, which the European Union, the US, Japan, developed countries, all these systems of preferences for developing countries which were positive discriminations, evaporates. Bye-bye. A trade-oriented development policy or a development-oriented trade policy. You have to change your mindset and the way you operate. Now, what does that mean? And that's my fourth point, uh, which is the last one. Uh, what does that mean in uh, policy terms for the European Union? How should the EU adjust uh, to these uh, changes, which I think uh, we've now understood are quite big, quite large, and quite rapid? In my view, it changes uh, things which we need to think about, which is what the European Commission is uh, meant to do, and then go to uh, the Council of Ministers, the Chamber of States, and the European Parliament, the Chamber of Citizens. Uh, a, this implies a change in our domestic agenda. When you look at all these evolutions, there's one very striking think, uh, which is that services, the ability to compete in services, the European competitiveness in services is issue number one. <coughs> it's a big change. It's more complex in political terms because producing services is something people don't see. If you produce tires or cars, you've got a factory, shh, there's a bit of smoke and people are entering the factory and they're getting out of the factory. You know, the sort of imagination is, you, you can easily understand what the factory is. If it's about health services, uh, or if you go and to your hairdresser and you say, I'm buying you a service which is hairdressing, he say, what service which is hairdressing? I'm just, I'm just helping you, you know, hairdressing. So this is a service. And the competitiveness of, of services producing uh, becomes uh, extremely important. And by the way, if you compare today the competitiveness of the US industry, the US economy and the European economy, you will see that industry-wise, we have the same level of competitiveness. We have roughly the same level of global productivity. Where the EU has a serious handicap vis-a-vis -vis US is services. And why is it so? Because we have not yet achieved what we decided 30 years ago we should do, uh, which is to have a unified internal market for services. And if we had an internal market for services with our 500 million consumer base, we would have a big comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis the US, which only has a sort of 300 million consumer base, roughly. Instead of using our weight and our capacity to generate economies of scale, we are in a game with the US in services where we have these economies of scale. And this is 
all the more important in the future that the part of the economy which is with services is uh, growing. The second priority, but I don't need to insist on this uh, here in Amsterdam, uh, is of course the huge importance of properly oiled infrastructures and logistics in this world of global supply chain. Now, I think there's one country uh, in the European Union which is the champion of logistics, and it's uh, the Netherlands, and I've seen that for many, many years of my life, whether in uh, France or in Brussels or in Geneva, so I don't need to insist on that. But the expansion of this global supply chain creates a situation where the efficiency of the logistics becomes more and more of a comparative advantage. And again, uh, this is uh, basically extremely good news for a, a country like this one, which in many ways has, and for many reasons, and we French sometimes uh, at the origin of this region, notably when we expelled Protestants, which was a huge blunder in uh, economic terms, but that's uh, history. Uh, but your country in this new world has assets which it did not have in the old world. So that's roughly for the sort of a, a domestic agenda and how the EU domestic agenda should adjust to this new reality. Of course, this also has important consequences on the international agenda, on the way the EU addresses this new world of uh, obstacle to trade. And there, conclusion number one is that EU should try and keep as much as possible the control of precaution. We happen, together with the US, to be the two places on this planet where we have the highest level of precaution as compared to other markets and other production systems. Uh, this level of precaution we impose on our producers. We impose on foreign producers in so far uh, as they want to reach out to our markets. But for the moment, we don't really impose it to production systems like China if it's not about what China export to EU or to US. This is a huge challenge for the future. And this, by the way, is the reason why the TTIP uh, makes, in my view, a lot of sense strategically, uh, because if the two places on this planet where the level of precaution is the highest coalize in order to govern precaution together with the necessary regulatory convergence, then the odds that this will become the world standard are extremely high. And these, then this world standard will not only apply to what we import, it will create a situation where foreign producers for their domestic market will have an objective interest in using the standard we have creating in order to benefit from economies of scales in their own market. <coughs> if EU and, let's say, to take a simple example, we in Europe have small bumpers. In US, I was there yesterday, they have big bumpers. Now, while you have small bumpers on European cars and big bumpers on American cars, it simply is because the European Road Authority has crash tests, the result of which is that you don't need big bumpers. And the US Road Safety Authority has engineers and mechanics and crash tests and, and softwares who show that you put a crash test and then the conclusion, oh, you need big bumpers. Now, that's not something <coughs> rocket science. And there's not a lot of ideology or imagination uh, in uh, the size of bumpers. I would not say the same about animal welfare or GMOs or data privacy, which belong to another part of our brain, 
which is much more geared with uh, emotion than with uh, reason. But it shouldn't be too complex to decide that you know, we all have middle-sized bumpers. Uh, and if we produce a car and we export it to the US, we don't have to refit the car with a big bumper and the other way around. That makes a lot of sense. If US and EU decide we have middle-sized bumpers, Korea, Japan, China, will have to adjust to this size of bumpers. So we will have created the world benchmark <coughs> for size of bumpers in cars. And in many areas, if we do that properly, this becomes a comparative advantage for our producers. Now, it's complex. Why is it complex? Uh, for two reasons. First, you have all this area of bumpers-like issues. If you look at the level of precaution EU-US, in one third of the cases, EU is higher precaution than the US. In one third of the cases, US is higher precaution than EU. And this is something which not many Europeans would believe, but that's the reality. We Europeans believe we are more precaution than the US. That's not the reality. One third, one third, and in one third of the cases, the level of precaution is absolutely the same. Uh, take uh, 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 medicines, for instance, uh, new molecules which you market. But the way we clear these new things is so different that if I'm a producer, I have the same cost as if it was a different level of precaution. So that's the first problem, and regulatory convergence mutual recognition, what a harmonization, whatever tool you use, is to take place. It's going to be tough, huh? because at the depth of their minds, European road safety believe they are right, and US road safety believe they are right. So they have to discuss, they have to. But again, shouldn't be too complex. If you look on the other side at areas that were Imagination plays a big role in precaution. GMOs, data privacy, animal welfare. Then convergence will be much more difficult. And by the way, I've always advised the uh, European Commission when they ask for my advice not to front load this sort of issue. If we want to be serious about regulatory convergence, and that's 80% of the TTIP uh, trade uh, <coughs> and investment transatlantic partnership, let's start with the low hanging fruit, which do not raise complex uh, questions. And in this sense, and in this sense, the TTIP is the first new negotiation in this new world. There still will have to be a bit of protection because the old world is not totally dead, it's dying, but it takes time. It's like stars uh, who are dead, but the light of which uh, you still uh, see because the time it takes to get your eye uh, is such that they, they, they can be dead for 200 years. That's a bit what tariffs are today, but they are still there. So you still have to cope with that. But that's 20% of the TTIP, 80% is with regulatory convergence. Another consequence, and I already mentioned that, so I don't insist, this, is that if the EU wants to integrate its trade and development policy, which is a tradition in the case of the European Union, uh, as I said, no way you can keep positive discriminations in the world of precaution. So you have to do it otherwise. Uh, you have to adjust, and I started doing this when I was DG of WTO, after the experiences I had when I was EU Trade Commissioner, you have to go aid for trade, which is providing developing countries with not better tariffs uh, or better uh, lower level of precaution, but measures, technical assistance that help them growing their capacity to trade with you, including in standard matching. And increasing the capacity of the Rwanda as a country to scale up its pesticide residue control is, in these conditions, a great investment for development. As, by the way, will probably be uh, uh, 
helping uh, Rwanda or Uganda or Ethiopia uh, to move uh, more rapidly to e-commerce for part of what they do. I was yesterday in Washington, as I said, there was a big uh, discussion about uh, African agriculture, to which I participated uh, together with the uh, SecGen of uh, Angtan. And the SecGen of Angtan said, you know, Lamy invented aid for trade uh, in 05, 06. We now have to invent aid for e-trade. And I think it does make a lot of sense to refocus part of what we do for development in this uh, direction. Another set of areas, and I, I just mentioned it, uh, uh, I don't have time to insist on it, is care must be taken notably with developing countries and newcomers in world trade in the area of trade finance. Trade finance oils 90% of world trade. 90% of world trade implies some sort of financial bridge, whether it's open account, whether it's a letter of credit. It happened that with the re-regulation of the financial sector and a number of perfectly legitimate and understandable precautions, which bankers, and I was a banker for part of my life, I know as a KYC, uh, know your customer, the level of precaution which you have in trade finance now is such that a lot of small players, small country, small bank cannot afford anymore the cost of trade finance because the administrative cost of piling up data, information about who sits in the board and what was the father of the one who sits in the board and the grandfather, whether there was a danger there, this, all these things pile up and this creates a situation which very indirectly, but do impact a lot of uh, trade uh, for many countries. So these are the sort of consequences which need to be uh, drawn from this change, and of course, uh, starting with the European Union, uh, which leads me to my conclusion, huh, which is that this new world uh, uh, is, in a way, probably much more difficult to handle than the previous one. Uh, if if a trade negotiation was between somebody that produces bicycles and somebody that produces scrap metal, it's quite obvious that after a good night of negotiation, uh, the one that produces scrap metal uh, will lower the tariff so that the one that produces bicycles produces bicycles cheaper so that the cheap bicycles, the guy that produces scrap metal imports are cheaper. It's a classical win-win you know, situation. It may take years if the two negotiators do not agree on the price, which is how much does my reduction on scrap metal is worth your reduction on bicycle. And that's a bazaar negotiation, and that can last you know, forever. And bazaar negotiation sometimes, but there's nothing really difficult. And if people are good sense, they will say, okay, I mean, I wanted a 20% reduction, okay, let's settle for 10, and then 10 years later, we'll do the remaining 10, which is what happened, roughly. In the world of precaution, this is simply impossible. A, because it's not going to be trade negotiators that will decide what is the proper level of pesticide residue. The ones that are doing this are specialist in phytosanitary matters, and they are specialists of the impact of pesticide on human health. And second, it will never work with a negotiation. If I'm the EU and you are the US, I'm not going to exchange my level of precaution on lighters against your level of precaution on toys. That won't work. We just have to go the hard road of harmonizing our level of precaution on lighters and our level of precaution on toys. No trade-off. And beware, if you give the impression that you are heading to trade-off, you're dead with public opinion, which is, by the way, what's happening with TTIP. The TTIP had a very tough start with public opinion in Europe for a simple reason that the ones that launched it, i.e. the Commission and with the US Trade Representative, totally missed 
the narrative that they were launching something in the new world and not in the old world. And people are not stupid. People started realizing that this was about a level of precaution. And it only changed recently when at last, after three and a half years, which is a long time in politics, the European Commission said, we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that this will not done, be done to the cost of reducing precaution. It took them three and a half years to enunciate this fundamental political message. And this is one of the reasons why, for instance, in Germany, uh, TTIP uh, has such a bad reputation. And we know uh, Germany is not a protectionist country, let's say. Not much of a protectionist country, uh, but it is a precautionist country. Uh, Germany has its own reasons stemming from Nordic mythology plus a uh, few things which are more recent uh, to be more sensitive than others about precaution. And those who launched TTIP did not get that right, which is one of the reasons why they have these problems. So, conclusion, in this new world, opening trade still makes sense under conditions which were not part of uh, today's uh, discussion. And there are conditions which I explained one by one in the book I published when I left WTO, which is called the Geneva Consensus, which is under which condition does trade opening work as opposed uh, to the Washington consensus. That's a thing which still works. So we still have to open trade. Opening trade can still deliver benefits, but the way to do it is very different if we want it to work. Entails a lot more of public sensitivities and thus entails a lot more of transparency, public debate, accountability, which trade negotiators have to factor in uh, in the future more than what they've done in the past. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>